from goats at about the age of 15 or 16, and you become either an artist or a scientist. And basically, you never speak to the other side again. You're kind of taught almost to despise each other. And because, of course, you're, um, all, most of your opinion formers, your writers, your broadcasters, and so on, uh, tend to come from the art side, um, if you're a scientist, you tend um, not, to get, um, not to get very good press. Um, but for me, leaving science behind when I did was a very, very tough decision, but um, I did. Uh, we, as I say, you have to make up your mind at the age of about 16, and I went on to the art side. And really, for a, for a whole period, my interest in science kind of languished. And I want to tell you a little bit about what rekindled it. Now, it may surprise you that what rekindled it was not actually um, a deep interest in, in, in cosmology, though I try to take a little bit of an interest in the universe out there, but it's very, very big. Um, um, but, but was rather a, a, about something that was going on down here. Now, a few years ago, and this will be about the mid-'80s, I had a phone call. Somebody phoned up and said, uh, we'd like you to go to Madagascar, um, there's a plane leaving in a couple of weeks. We'd like you to be on it. There's a, um, an animal we'd like to go, you to go and find, which is called the eye eye. It's a very rare, rare form of lemur. Um, so we'd like you to go and do this, please. And I, assuming they got the wrong number, said yes before they could discover their mistake. <laughs> Um, but I didn't know anything about Madagascar. I didn't know anything about lemurs. I didn't know anything about ecology. And I think that's why they thought, let's send him. <laughs> so I thought, well, I better find out something about it and discovered all sorts of interesting things. Um, it turns out that Madagascar is almost a sort of separate planet embedded in ours because it's been isolated from the rest of the world for so long. Um, there was a point at which Gondwana land split up. This all sounds like some 70s rock band going there. Sort of. <laughs> separate ways of reasons of musical differences, but as you will probably remember, um, Gondwana land was a giant supercontinent that consisted of South America, um, Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, and, um, and indeed Australia, though apparently not New Zealand, which turns out to be a lot of sort of gunk that came up from under the ocean. Um, um, and, and what happened at that point was, of course, that uh, each of these... Um, uh, each of these land masses took with them a representative sample of what were the, you know, the, the, the life forms dominant at the time. And at that time, one of the dominant life forms in all the world was this animal called the lemur. Now, lemurs are small, cuddly, furry creatures that uh, live mostly in trees. They're a bit sort of cat-like, a bit sort of monkey-like. Um, and they were the dominant primate through all the world. And um, when Gondwana land split up and Madagascar sailed off into the Indian Ocean, it took with it a representative sample of the wildlife of the time, including a lot of lemurs. And as I say, it was then completely isolated from the whole of the rest of the world. What happened in, in the following years was that a new animal arose, a new animal that was much more intelligent than the lemur, according to it, uh, much more competitive, much more aggressive, and also much more interested in all the things it could do with twigs. It was fascinated by twigs. There's so much you can do with twigs. You can sort of dig under the bark of trees for grubs. You can sort of make holes in the ground. You can hit each other over the head with twigs. Um, there's an awful lot you can do with them. If there had been copies of Twig User magazine around in those days, these animals would have been at newsstands every week. <clears throat> And because they were, as I say, more competitive and more aggressive than the lemurs, but lived in the same habitat, they, lived, they were forest-dwelling, tree-living creatures, they effectively supplanted the lemurs in all parts of the world other than Madagascar, because they could never get to Madagascar, because it was so isolated. Until about 1,500 years ago, when due to astonishing advances in twig technology. <laughs> the monkeys, or rather the monkeys' descendants, i.e. us, finally made it to Madagascar in boats and planes and, and so on. And finally, the lemurs were facing, the last lemurs were facing those who had effectively been their mortal enemy in the history of the world. The monkeys had got to Madagascar. 
And so suddenly the, 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 the lemurs uh, were suddenly sort of fighting for their survival again, or rather lazing around for their survival. <clears throat> now, it turns out that the, uh, the rarest of the lemurs, or what was thought of to be the rarest of the lemurs at the particular point I'm talking about, which, as I say, was the mid-'80s, was an animal called the eye eye. Now, the eye eye is a very, very extraordinary animal. At that time, nobody had seen one for years. It's a nocturnal animal. Um, um, it lives in the heart of the rainforest, and it was thought at that time there were only about 15 of them left. And it's a very extraordinary animal. It looks like an assemblage of other animals. It's got sort of big fox-like ears and sort of uh, um, bat-like eyes. Actually, its eyes were rather like Marty Feldman's. They didn't sort of look in the same direction. And, uh, um, uh, and little sort of bitey rabbit's teeth. And um, this tail that was like an ostrich feather. But its, its strangest feature was its middle finger which was much, much longer than the other fingers, uh, and skeletally thin and bony. It was like a twig. And it used to use this, this finger for burrowing under the bark of trees to get at grubs. It turns out there's one other animal in the whole of the world that has this feature. It's um, um, a, a, a long middle finger. And this is an animal called the... Um, it lives in Papua New Guinea, and it's called... I love zoologists. They have such... Um, vivid imaginations. It's called the long-fingered possum. Um, and in this instance, the, the long-fingered possum, uh, it's not the third finger, it's the fourth finger that is uh, 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 skeletally thin and very long. And this indicates to us that there's actually no relationship between these animals. It's a case of convergent evolution, that evolution has sort of flowed down the particular path um, uh, twice, but in a completely unrelated way. Um, and it turns out the, uh, the, the, the thing that's caused this, the common factor between these two environments, is that in Madagascar and in Papua New Guinea, there are no woodpeckers. And um, in the absence of woodpeckers, it means there's a food source of the grubs under the bark of trees is kind of going, going, going spare. And if, uh, if the birds aren't going to get it, then the, then the mammals will either pick up a twig or indeed grow a twig and go and get it. Because wherever there's a food source, something will, will develop a way of going and getting it. So, as I say, the, um, the eye eye was thought to be... That it was thought there were only about 15 of them left. And they lived actually on a tiny little rainforest island just off the coast of Madagascar called Nosy Mangabe. It was thought they were completely extinct on the mainland. So I went there with a sort of small party, including a zoologist called Mark Carwardine. And um, we flew in a 747 from Europe uh, to Tananarive, which is the capital of Madagascar. And then we went in a sort of a battered old jalopy of an aeroplane to fly up to the northeast uh, corner of the island. And then we went from there in a, in a kind of decreasingly excellent series of carts and trucks that would take us up to this little port where there was going to be a boat to take us across to Nosy Mangabe. And um, when we arrived at the port, we couldn't find the boat that was meant to be there for us. And we kept on saying, where's this boat? And people would point and we'd say, well, I, I don't see what you're pointing at. And partly the reason we couldn't see what they were pointing at was that there was this terrible, rotting old hulk in the way. Um, and, of course, yes, it was the terrible, rotting old hulk they were actually pointing at. Um, and we made our way across. I, I mean, the basic problem with this boat was that it was, it was full of sea, which I thought was not, <laughs> not the point of boats. Um, and um, so we made our way across to, to Nosy Mangabe, and then spent day after day, or rather night after night, because as I say, it's a nocturnal animal, traipsing through the rainforest in what can only be described uh, as the rain, <laughs> looking for this animal that a month ago I'd never heard of. And I began to think, what on earth am I doing here? It's extraordinary, you know, sort of, sort of sitting... Um, sitting under sort of tarpaulin, soaking wet, trying to keep your camera dry, um, getting sort of tired and cross and ratty because every night you're out doing this. And they were never going to see this animal. 